Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is again my great, great pleasure to welcome you for this third lecture in our lecture series on sovereign debt. And uh, it's even an, a greater pleasure because I welcome today not only two colleagues, but also uh, two friends and two French. And, uh, <laughs> French friends, as I suggested. And then uh, Professor Mathias Audit, who is uh, now at the University of Paris 1 Pantheon Sorbonne, uh, but whom I met in Brazil. And uh, so it, it happens. And uh, Regis Bismuth, who is now professor at uh, Sciences Po Paris, Institut d'études politiques uh, de Paris. I've wondered whether I would dare say that uh, Regis has. Uh, some time ago, when I was still very young, being my student, and... Uh, <laughs> 2003, 2004, oh. 12 years ago, yeah. <laughs> so, as I said... 13 years ago, 13 yeah. years ago. And, uh, and now is uh, a, a colleague. So I'm very grateful that they have both accepted to come today for this lecture. We are going now to, to hear about uh, some more precise cases, uh, more precisely Argentina and, uh, and Greece. Uh, I recall that this lecture series would not have been possible without the support of the Fonds National de la Recherche, and I, I thank again the FNR for its support. And of course, my thanks to the staff of the Institute for organizing this lecture with always this may, the same efficiency and in addition always uh, smiling and of course thanks to uh, Enoch and Alain, the two research fellows who have put together this lecture series which turns out to be really a great, great success. So I give immediately the floor to Matthias Wodit. Um, hello, everybody. I've got uh, several microphones. Um, and uh, thank you, Ellen, for your very uh, kind words. And thank you for your, your very kind invitation as well. Um, we, in fact, uh, first uh, met in Brazil when we talked about uh, sovereign debt two years ago. So uh, we are talking today on the, on the very same issue. Um, and I would like to thank, uh, of course, as a well, world, the Mac Planck uh, uh, staff. Uh, for organizing my travel and uh, accommodations uh, uh, in such an uh, efficient way, I must say, especially Mrs. Uh, Logrio. Um, but let's uh, let's get to to our to our topic. Um, so I will be talking about uh, the implication of uh, recent sovereign debt litigation, and more precisely, um, the, the the sovereign debt litigation regarding Argentina and Greece. Um, Yes, this is something I need. <coughs> and first of all, um, I will give you, for, 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 for those of you who, who do not have uh, uh, any precise information regarding the Argentinian case and the, Argent and the Greek case, I will give the, the main facts and the main proceedings uh, regarding these two cases. So, regarding Argentina uh, as a beginning, um, in December uh, 2001, uh, Argentina has uh, defaulted on his, uh, on his uh, sovereign debt. Uh, it was uh, a unilateral uh, default, which means that the, the Argentinian president in December uh, 2001 has taken the decision, it was a temporary uh, president actually, uh, who stayed for nearly one week, uh, and he has taken only one decision, which was uh, to stop, uh, to uh, reimburse uh, the, the Argentinian debt. And that was uh, the largest sovereign default in history, uh, around, uh, as you can see, uh, nine, 90, uh, 95 uh, uh, billions of US dollars. Um, in fact, it's still today the largest sovereign default in history <coughs> because, as I will uh, 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 tell you uh, later on, the Greek default is not a proper default uh, because there was a restructuration. So, uh, uh, so regarding a, a real unilateral default, Argentina is, is the largest in the world history of the sovereign debt. Uh, after this default, um, 
Ar the Argentina, Argentinian uh, government has proposed two uh, offers to the bondholders, which uh, in 2005 and 2010, which has been accepted by uh, a very large number of, uh, of, uh, of bondholders, of Argentinian uh, bondholders, uh, nearly around 93% of the defaulted debt um, orders uh, had agreed on the, on the swaps bond offer. I must say that, if maybe you're not very familiar with that, but um, a restructuration process is like this. You have bonds, and the, the state is not paying anymore. Uh, uh, you're holding bonds. Uh, 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 and the state will make an offer which is to swap your old bonds against new bonds. But of course, with uh, uh, the new bonds are uh, less uh, uh, advantageous than the, than, the, than the old one. And on this one, the, the loss was around 65%. The air cut was around 65% uh, between 2005, the 2005 uh, restructuring uh, offer and the 2010 restructuring offer. Uh, but, uh, but at the end of the day, 93% uh, of the of the debt uh, has been uh, uh, um, has been uh, concerned by uh, by these two restructurings offer. But it left 7% uh, of the of the debt, uh, which uh, concern all the out creditors. That means creditors that did hold the the old bonds but did not accept the restructuring offer. And those uh, 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 creditors, all the out creditors, that's the name we give, it, give to them, um, they, they, they are important in what I've been, I will be uh, saying uh, during this conference because they, 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 they took the decision to, to go to court. So they took the decision to go to court and, um, and there are plenty of proceedings regarding this uh, Argentine default of 2001. Uh, first of all, you had domestic proceedings. That means proceedings by uh, domestic courts. Uh, you had some proceedings by the Argentinian courts, uh, which I uh, did not detail here, uh, especially by the administrative courts of, uh, of Argentina. Uh, but that's not, not very important uh, um, regarding the, 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 the world case. You have very important uh, uh, decisions of the US courts, and I only, I'm only mentioning here um, the, 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 the two main uh, decisions, there are plenty of them, and, uh, and they, uh, most of them have been uh, judged by uh, the South, uh, South District uh, New York Court, uh, and more precisely by one judge, uh, called the Judge Grieza, uh, uh, who, uh, who has been uh, in charge of the Argentinian case. Uh, the first one is a, a payment decision, the, the 2005, uh, 2006 sorry, uh, decision. It's a, it's a payment decision uh, by which the Judge Grieza has said uh, you have to pay uh, what it, what you have to pay the the all the, 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 the old out creditors. And the, the second one is the, the, the very famous Paris Passou uh, decision, with, uh, which I will uh, address uh, later on. So that's the two main uh, US court decisions, but you have plenty of others. You have one decision of the Supreme Court as well, which I didn't uh, mention here. Um, well, there are, there, there are a lot of other decisions, but that's the, the, the main de US decision. You have also decision from the European court, European domestic court, um, uh, you had several decisions in France, as you can uh, see that, uh, uh, in, uh, in 2011 and 2013, which, uh, which are very important for the, the evolution of the French uh, sovereign immunity uh, law, uh, because they did address this issue. This, uh, these cases uh, were cases based on uh, attachment of um, Argentinian assets in France uh, on the base of the, the 2005-2006 uh, New York decision. So uh, on this ground, NML Capital, which is uh, an hedge fund 
uh, some say a vulture fund, uh, some other say. Um, Edmund Capitan has tried to attach uh, um, um, uh, this, um, some uh, Argentinian assets in France, uh, but didn't succeed at the end, I must say. Uh, you have also some decisions in Belgium. I mentioned here one of the decisions, but there are others. And this decision is, um, uh, uh, is the decision related to the Paris Passu um, uh, 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 New York case. And you have also uh, some decision in the, in the UK uh, 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 regarding also the, the Paris, Paris Passu case. And I also mentioned the Ghana court decision, uh, which was a decision regarding the attachment of uh, uh, a warship, uh, an Argentinian warship in, uh, in Ghana, called the, the, the Libertad, and, uh, and which gave, uh, uh, after all, uh, the, the, the decision went to, to, to an international court, which I will mention in a minute. So you got also international proceedings regarding uh, the Argentinian case. And uh, here are the main proceedings. So you have um, quite a lot, uh, and I mean free by quite a lot, uh, treaty-based international arbitration. So that is um, international arbitration proceeding based on BITs, on bilateral investment treaties. Um, and, and these decisions are, for some of them, uh, they've been stopped for reason of uh, financing. For others, they're still pending. Uh, the, the, the first one, and which is also uh, maybe the, the, the most famous one, is the uh, Abaclad decision. Uh, it's very famous because it was the first one, and because at the beginning, there was around 60,000 claimants in this case, which is quite unusual for an arbitration proceeding. Uh, but there are also uh, uh, other, other proceedings. Um, uh, the claimants here were, um, for most of them, Italian, uh, Italian bond orders. Uh, and they, they, they took the decision, or maybe uh, uh, someone took the decision for them, or, or took the uh, or, uh, or, or proposed to these Italian bondholders to sue Argentina uh, by, uh, uh, international, uh, by international arbitration tribunal on, on the base of the BIT between Italy and, uh, and Argentina. You also have a decision from uh, the European Court of Human Rights, which is a decision following uh, the cases in France, <coughs> so the old out um, or hedge funds uh, uh, cases filed by the French court, and, and as France, the French court denied the, uh, the sovereign immunity of uh, the sovereign immunity of uh, Argentina, of um, not denied, sorry, uh, accepted the sovereign immunity of Argentina. Uh, 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 the, the French Court de Cassation accepted the, the sovereign immunity, and then um, the, the NML Capital went to the European Court of Human Rights, but uh, didn't succeed uh, by this court. And you have also a decision from the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, uh, which is a decision following the Ghana decision. Um, and uh, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea has taken uh, an order, an order uh, 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 to uh, Ghana uh, in order to, uh, to release the, the Libertad, the, the, the warship that has been attached in Ghana. <coughs> so we were a bit far from the law of the sea, but the decision has been taken. <coughs> so that is uh, what happened regarding the um, Argentinian uh, uh, cases, and as you say, as you see, uh, there have been a lot of proceedings uh, following this uh, Argentinian default in 2001. Let's get now to the to what we could call the the second uh, usual suspect, which is uh, Greece. Regarding Greece, um, as you might know. Um, Greece had a very uh, huge uh, debt, which we 
did discovered uh, uh, in 2008, um, and this uh, this depth was around uh, 350 billion, which was a uh, uh, 160% of the of the GDP, which is a lot, of course, uh, for that, which is. Uh, a, 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 an, an unsustainable uh, uh, debt. Um, the originality of um, the Greek debt, and more precisely of the Greek bonds, uh, especially compared to the Argentinian bonds, was that the Greek bonds were, uh, the, the issuance contract were submitted to Greek law. As uh, in the Argentinian case, uh, the, the Argentinian bonds were submitted, mo most of them, to a New York law, to a foreign law. And that, make, that has made a, quite a, an important difference between, because um, as the bonds were submitted to Greek law, uh, the Greek government and parliament has taken the decision to modify, to modify retroactively the Greek bonds by issuing a new law in February uh, 2012 and by inserting retroactively in those bonds what we called a collective action clause. Um, uh, for those who, do, who, do, who haven't heard of a collective action clause, a collective action clause is a clause by which you, um, you organize, let's say, a meeting of all the bondholders, and uh, the state will make an offer of, uh, uh, for, for restructuring uh, the bonds. And with a collective action clause, this offer can be accepted by a certain percentage of the bondholders. And if it is accepted by a certain percentage of the bondholders, then it will be a mandatory for all the bondholders. So here, the, the, the threshold was 50%. That means that if 50% of the Greek bonds, of 90% of the Greek bonds, uh, has accepted uh, uh, um, the, 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 the restructuring offer uh, issued by the Greek government, then it will be mandatory, has been mandatory, for all the, the bondholders, for 100% for of the bondholders. That is a collective action clause. So the, the Greek parliament has issued this new law that has retroactively insert collective action clause, CAC, in the Greek bonds. And after this, uh, this uh, February 2012 uh, law, uh, then, uh, of course, the adoption of the, the restriction plan uh, was uh, much more easier, and, uh, 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 and it has been uh, uh, accepted in, uh, in March uh, 2012. And after that, uh, as you see, 96.9% of the Greek uh, debt has been uh, restructured, and the air cut um, uh, has been around 170 billion, which, which is a lot, uh, but not enough, because uh, you had a, a new uh, restructure, restructure of, the, of the Greek bond uh, last year. But quite different from this one, because this uh, was a, a private-owned uh, Greek debt, and last year, the uh, restructuring process concerned only public-owned uh, public, uh, uh, Greek debt. That means debt owned by uh, the IMF and uh, uh, the European uh, Bank, etc., etc. So that is the, Greek, the, the, the main facts. Um, let's get now to the, to the main proceedings regarding Greece. So, you had, like for Argentina, uh, um, uh, some, uh, some domestic proceedings by the Greek courts, uh, especially the administrative courts in, uh, in, in Greece as well, uh, um, uh, until the, the, the Greek Conseil d'État, uh, Council of State. You had also um, some proceeding by the German court, uh, with quite a famous uh, decision uh, uh, in, in March 2016. You had also European proceedings by the EU court, 
uh, especially two very interesting uh, decisions, one from the Court of Justice and the other one from the EU Tribunal. You had also a decision from the European Court of Human Rights. And the, all these decisions, uh, and that is also the case for the international proceedings, uh, they all uh, are dealing with um, the, the 2012 restructuring process, Greek restructuring process. So they all have the, the same uh, topic, and, and, and for most of them, precisely this uh, February 2012 law that has inserted retroactively a uh, collective action clause within the Greek bonds. And you have also two uh, treaty-based arbitration. They are, they are uh, based on, on BITs as well, on bilateral investment treaties. Uh, um, uh, so one, the first one, um, it's a bit complicated because it was a, um, a BIT which uh, exists between, if I do remember well, between Slovakia and, um, and, and Greece. Uh, but the claimant was, uh, the principal claimant was from Cyprus. Um, uh, and we had an award, an award uh, in 2015. And then the decision of the ad hoc committee from the ICSID in, uh, in uh, last uh, September 2016. And, uh, and the case has been, the, the claim has been dismissed. And we have a pending case. Uh, 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 between the Cyprus Popular Bank uh, public, between uh, again, sorry, uh, the Hellenic Republic, which is for the moment uh, a pending case, also a pending case, also um, a grounded of uh, on the BIT, the BIT between Cyprus and uh, and Greece. So that that is. Um, the, the, the main proceeding regarding Greece. So as you can uh, see, uh, if, we, if we have a general overview uh, of uh, all, all I've been said uh, until now, um, for these two states and for uh, uh, the Argentinian default in 2001 and the, 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 the restructuring process, the Greek restructuring process in 2012, for these two examples, you have a multiple four-hour litigation. You have domestic courts from different, national, uh, nation, from different nationalities. You have international proceedings in, in different uh, uh, forums, uh, uh, in the European Court of Justice, in the European Court of Human Rights, uh, by uh, international arbitration tribunal. So you have, you're facing a high risk of inconsistent judgments, of course. Uh, that is the... The problem, and the last one is that all the, these two examples, they are dealing with a state which is obviously uh, uh, that is obvious, which is insolvent. But you do not have an insolvency proceeding. So all these cases, they're uh, uh, treating those two states like uh, usual uh, debtors. Uh, that do not reimburse their debt. But they do not, all these cases, they do not take into consideration the fact that those states are insolvent. Why? Because there is no insolvency proceeding regarding states. You have insolvency proceeding for, uh, uh, for uh, corporation, you have insolvency proceeding uh, in certain uh, national domestic law, uh, for uh, uh, private persons, but you do not insolvency. You do not have insolvency proceeding for states, and from my point of view, at least, that might be a problem. But let's get now. Uh, um, let's uh, present the structure of of my speech after this uh, in quite long introduction. Um, I will first of all present the sovereign bonds uh, uh, contractual structure in order to more deeply understand uh, uh, the, 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 the litigation issues. And regarding the litigation issues, I will talk about the procedural issues, then the, the issues on the merit, and then the enforcement issues. 
And the last one, which is the fifth one, <laughs> I can see that there's a, um, a mistake here, uh, we will try to, to have a step forward. So let's get to the first part. So the sovereign bond contractual structure. In order to um, deeply understand the litigation regarding uh, uh, sovereign debt, you have to understand the sovereign, bond, sovereign bonds contractual structure. And the first information I can uh, give here is that usually, and nowadays, the states, any state in the world, uh, will borrow money through bonds. Uh, you can have some type of credit, bank, uh, uh, credit uh, contract with banks. That can happen. Uh, but the, 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 the vast majority of the sovereign bonds, the, of, of the sovereign debt of any states, is based on bonds. So wh what is a bond? Um, a bond is grounded on, normally, an, ins an uh, insurance contract. So the state will take the decision to issue bonds. It will establish a contract, and within this contract, you will find, of course, uh, the contractual uh, disposition, the contractual terms. That would be the amount which is borrowed, that would be uh, uh, the rate, that would be uh, 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 the time uh, when the, the, the money will be reimbursed. That would be uh, um, the, the definition of the default, what would be considered as a default within the contract. That would be uh, the applicable law, eventually, the competent court if there is a litigation, eventually. You could also find collective action clauses and things like that. So that's what's inside a contract. OK, uh, so you have an issuance. The debt of state is issuing bonds uh, based on this insurance contract. Then you have primary subscribers. That is the first bondholders. So they buy the bonds, and they, uh, in fact, borrow uh, money to uh, uh, the land, sorry, borrow money to the, to the debt of state. But the particularity of the bonds, of course, is that a bond can be uh, sold to someone else. So you have what we call a, a, a secondary market. Uh, and on this secondary, ma secondary market, I can uh, uh, sell my bonds to uh, another uh, buyer. And it might be in, uh, for a different price, actually. I mean, if the state is in a bad uh, economic uh, situation, then the, the price of the bonds, of course, will be uh, uh, less interesting on the secondary market. But what we have to uh, uh, what I have to point out here to point out here is that any uh, secondary market buyer, um, at the time when he uh, 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 he will buy the bond, is automatically linked. I mean, contractually linked with the issuant, issue, uh, the, the, the debtor state. That means that any bond holders have a contractual link with the state. And this contractual link is based on the issuance contract. And that is quite important for the, for the litigation. So once we, we've said that, let's now uh, get to uh, our first litigation issue, uh, I could say, which is uh, procedural issues. When you have uh, a litigation regarding sovereign bonds, there are, from my point of view, two main uh, procedural issues. The first, are, the first one is, who are the claimants? And the second is, which defendant should they litigate with? So first issue, first procedural issue, who are the claimants?
uh, based on what I've said regarding the, the, the bond uh, contractual structure, it's in fact inherent to the bond market that for one issuance of bonds, you have many orders. You have hundreds, a thousand sometimes of orders on one side, and the state on his own on the other side. And this is why in many of the cases uh, involving Greece or involving Argentina, you have a lot of claimants. You have a lot of claimants because that is how the bond markets, uh, the bonds uh, are working. And in order to uh, deal with this uh, multiple uh, claimants dilemma, with the, 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 the fact that for one issuance you have a lot of potential claimants, uh, you would need a specific uh, 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 fora, and you would need a specific solution. Uh, so one solution could be class actions. Uh, that could work. Uh, as, uh, more, that could work uh, eventually in the U.S., where the class action is uh, is uh, is uh, very uh, developed. But uh, there have been some attempts to uh, for class actions against Argentina uh, following the 2001 uh, default. But the class actions were not uh, uh, certified by the U.S. court, so it didn't work at the end. Second solution is treaty-based arbitration, um, BIT-based arbitration. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if you're all familiar with uh, investment arbitration, but uh, uh, investment arbitration used to be a, a kind of arbitration based on treaty, on investment treaty, and uh, um, the aim of this uh, proceeding is to permit uh, uh, to uh, to give um, uh, to uh, to give an indemnity uh, to an investor uh, which has been uh, badly treated by uh, an host state, an host state. Uh, so normally, in treaty-based uh, tr investment treaty-based arbitration, you have let's say one, two, maybe three claimants, sometimes four. Uh, but when arrived this uh, sovereign debt, sovereign bond uh, arbitration based on BITs, you have, uh, it, uh, you have a, a, a much more claimants, of course, like in the Abaclet case, where you have, at the beginning, uh, 60,000 claimants, which is not usual at all for duty-based arbitration, and which raised a lot of problems, of, uh, especially of... Um, uh, of uh, dealing with all these claimants. And even 90 claimants, like in the Ambifiante Officio versus Argentina uh, claim, uh, uh, even 90 claimants might be difficult to, to deal with uh, within arbitration. But that's all the solution that, uh, that exists for the moment. Second, uh, second uh, aspect of, uh, of the claimants, uh, in the bond market, you have, in fact, two types of investors. You have the primary investors, which, has, which are the, the primary uh, subscribers to the bonds, and then you have the secondary market investors. If you go by the domestic courts, there's no real difference to make. Because if you go by the domestic courts, it means that uh, uh, it's the person holding the bonds at the moment where, when the, 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 the court is, uh, is seized, um, that is the, the, the litigator. Um, so there is no pro problem of making a difference between uh, primary subscribers and uh, uh, secondary market uh, bond holders. There is no difference to make uh, in principle, but maybe, may, um, at, at least it had been said, that for certain uh, secondary market uh, bond holders, buyers, there is a special uh, 
uh, a treatment to, uh, to, to, to be uh, uh, recognized. And those uh, uh, specific bond orders, secondary market bond orders, are the, what we call the vulture funds, which are uh, hedge funds uh, specialized in, uh, in distressed uh, debts. So they buy bonds on the secondary market uh, for, for a low price, and then they litigate to obtain 100% of the bond. And we can see now that, uh, in fact, in, 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 at least in certain countries, like, uh, like, uh, like in France, uh, like in Belgium, like in the UK, uh, 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 now the vulture funds are considered as, uh, as bad uh, litigators, and, uh, uh, and they are domestic law uh, trying to uh, uh, get them out of the judicial system. Um, still, the, this difference of, between primary investor and secondary market investors. When we go uh, to, when we look to, uh, when we look at treaty-based arbitration tribunal, uh, here there might be a question, and, uh, and and more precisely, a question of jurisdiction. Why? Because to use the BIT system, you have to be considered as an investor regarding the BIT, regarding the, the, the investor definition of the BIT. And, um, I mean, if you go in a country and you uh, uh, build a bridge or uh, you're exploiting a mine, okay, you're an investor. But if you are an Italian bond order and you go uh, uh, in the street uh, where you live in Italy and you go to your... Uh, to your bank, and you buy a product, a financial product, and the, within this financial product, there's a little bit of Argentinian uh, bonds. But you don't know there's bonds within this product, but you buy it. Can you be considered as an investor, as a foreign investor within the BIT? So, of course, the question has been raised uh, uh, within the BIT uh, uh, cases I've mentioned, I've mentioned previously. And what has been said, especially in the Abaclad case, is that, yes, there are investors, because the funds generated by the bonds serve to finance the Argentinian economic development. So that was one of the main uh, uh, arguments that has been uh, raised by the arbitration tribunal, uh, in the Abeclat uh, case. That, that could be debatable. Uh, it could be debatable for primary investor, but why not? But the main question is, uh, what is it regarding the secondary market investors? Because the secondary market investors, they do not give money to the state. They give money to the actual bond holder. Uh, 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 so can you say, that a, a secondary market investor uh, 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 is financing the development of the debtor states? Well, my, my opinion is, uh, is no, but uh, uh, it seems that it's not the, what uh, the, the, the arbitration tribunal has, uh, has said within the, 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 the Abaclad case. But my main point here is uh, secondary market investors, they do not transfer any fund to the debtor states. So my opinion is they should not be considered as investors regarding the investment treaty. Um, but that's my opinion, and that is not the opinion uh, of the arbitration tribunal, in, uh, especially in the Abaclat uh, case. But my main point is uh, that uh, uh, um, if there is no real difference to make between primary investors and secondary market investors within, uh, uh, regarding sorry, domestic courts, there might be one to draw uh, regarding treaty-based arbitration tribunal. Second procedural uh, issue, in which difference should, uh, should the claimants litigate with? Of course, uh, I mean, the, the normal, the logical way is to litigate with the debtor state. Um, but, in fact, 
uh, uh, it seems that the success that you can have when, lit when you're litigating with the debtor state is, uh, is very, very far from 100%. So that's why the claimants have tried other ways, and they've tried to sue other kind of, uh, uh, of defendants. They've tried to sue the financial international institution, for example. Uh, uh, and especially there's a case that I've, been, that I've mentioned previously uh, uh, by the EU Tribunal of uh, 7 October 2015 against the European Central Bank. Um, in this case, uh, the ECB was a bond holder, was a Greek bond holder. But the ECB has made a swap uh, with the Greek institution just before the February 2012 law. Um, and by this swap, the, 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 the ECB has obtained new bonds with new serial numbers, but exactly the same conditions. But with, with this swap, the ECB um, has been excluded from uh, the, 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 2000 Febru the February 2012 uh, Greek law that has uh, retroactively uh, insert um, the, the collective action clauses. And this has been viewed by some other bond holders um, as a ground for a responsibility of the ECB. And that's why uh, they, they, they filed a claim against the ECB uh, 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 by, the, by the European uh, Tribunal. But the responsibility of the ECB has been denied in the case. Over uh, defendants could be the successful holdouts, as uh, NML Capital, for example, which did uh, have uh, obtained a great success with the Paris Passou uh, 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 litigation. But from my point of view, it's difficult to, to find a proper uh, a legal ground for the bondholders to, to sue the successful or doubts. Uh, last, uh, but maybe not least, um, uh, defendant could be a state which is not willing to enforce a debt claimed against a foreign state. Uh, as in France, for example, uh, all the, the claim that has been filed by the French court against Argentina, they did not succeed uh, uh, because of so the French uh, views on sovereign immunity, sovereign immunities. Um, so there is now pending case in France uh, by the, the French administrative courts by which the claimants are saying Okay, you gave sovereign immunity to Argentina. Me, as a bondholder, I didn't obtain uh, uh, the reimbursement of my funds. So this is a ground for the responsibility of the French state. So the French state should pay uh, uh, what uh, uh, has been claimed against Argentina. Um, so this, uh, these cases are, are, are pending in in the, by the French administrative court. And this um, legal way, I must say, or, 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 or uh, uh, yes, legal way, has been mentioned by the European Court on, of uh, Human Rights uh, in its uh, 13 January 2015 case, NML Capital versus France. So that, that could be an option but I would be, between us, I would be very surprised um, if um, the, 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 French state, the French state is uh, sentenced, uh, sentenced on, on, on the ground of, um, uh, of this, uh, uh, on this ground. I would be very surprised. Maybe it will happen, we'll see. Let's get now to the merit issues. Um, there is, uh, regarding the merit issues, um, in fact, there is two possible legal grounds. The normal one is a contract-based uh, litigation. 
but there is also some possibility to, to, uh, to file uh, tort-based uh, uh, cases. So, um, contract-based cases, in fact, what we did observe is two kinds of cases. The first one is bond payment litigation. So that's what happened uh, for Argentina with the 2006 uh, a case and the, the multi enforcement, the, the enforcement multi proceeding abroad in France, in, uh, in, uh, in Ghana, etc. etc. But, th but th this was not a, a credit success. And that happened also to Greece with uh, a, a, German, uh, a German case, which led to the, to the 8 March 2016 decision. But the Greek court has judged that it was not a proper contractual case because, in fact, the main issue here was not the contract, but was this Greek law that has retroactively inserted a collective action clause within the, the, the Greek bond submitted to Greek law. Um, so that's a usual bond payment litigation. And it seems that it doesn't work. Um, but uh, the hedge funds uh, are try something else. Um, I will not get into too, will not be will get too much into details regarding the Paris Passu litigation uh, because we could uh, uh, have a, a world conference on this. But um, what I could say is that uh, within the the Argentina. Uh, issuance, bond insurance contract, there was a specific clause, which is the Paris Passu clause. And this Paris Passu clause is in fact saying that you should not treat differently uh, the different creditors. And on this ground of this clause, uh, the Juge Grieza, the, the New York judge, has ordered uh, what we call a retable payment, which means um, if you, Argentina, you're paying, let's say, 1% uh, of the whole amount of the uh, restructured bonds to the uh, restructured bond orders, you should also pay 1% to the uh, one percent of the initial bonds to the initial uh, bond orders. Of course, 1% I mean, it's the same percentage, but it's not the same amount, of course. So that was the, 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 the retail payment that has been uh, decided by Judge Grieza, and which, at the end of the day, uh, 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 led to a settlement between Argentina and NML Capital, uh, 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 which is, in fact, a subsidiary of Elliott Associate, the very famous uh, hedge fund. And, uh, uh, and now the case is, is settled, and, uh, and we don't know uh, uh, um, what, is the, 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 what is the amount of money that, uh, that the, 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 the edge fund has, uh, has won uh, on, on this ground, but it's certainly uh, a lot. Uh, the other uh, um, uh, possible uh, litigation ground is a, a responsibility-based case. So you will not ground your claim on the contract, on the bond contract. You will ground your case on the responsibility of the state. That could be an international responsibility, especially, uh, so BIT-based. And more precisely, that uh, uh, could be uh, uh, that the state has uh, expropriated indirectly expropriated uh, the investors. So all the exit cases against Argentina and Greece, they are based on this broad idea of an international, BIT-based international responsibility uh, of the state. Or it could also be a responsibility of another claimant, as a DCB, uh, uh, that is the, the case I was mention mentioning um, earlier. So we've seen the procedural issue, we've seen the issues on merit. Uh, let's have a few words now on the 
the enforcement issue, issues. Um, enforcement issues is important because once you have uh, a judgment or an award sentencing the state, then you have to enforce it. Um, but the problem with enforcement, of course, is the sovereign immunity. Um, and, uh, and of, of course, any states benefit from a sovereign immunity, but within the Argentinian bonds, there was a waiver of, uh, of sovereign immunity. But even with this waiver, the enforcement uh, process, at least in France, did not succeed. Um, and uh, another point is, we see now the development of law against virtual funds. I've been mentioned that uh, uh, earlier. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a bit different than sovereign immunity. That is specific law saying if you're a virtual fund, well, you cannot uh, 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 obtain a decision uh, that is uh, sentencing the set, or at least you cannot obtain 100% of the bonds. So you have the first law was in the UK. Uh, you have another one in Belgium, which is a bit more recent. And there is one to come in France, uh, which has been uh, voted by, uh, by the parliament already, and which will, uh, that is the, the law, what we call Sapin 2, from the name of the, 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 the Minister of Finance. And this, in this law, Sapin 2, you have an article 24 uh, bis, uh, which is an article which is focusing on, on virtual funds, uh, and which does not allow virtual funds to obtain uh, uh, more of these, quite a lot of conditions, but to obtain uh, uh, by the French court uh, 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 more than one they've paid, more than what they have been paid to obtain the bonds on the secondary market. So that mm, will be the end of any virtual fund litigation by the French court. So if we, if we have a, 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 a temporary uh, a conclusion here, we could say uh, that regarding the litigation uh, 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 of, of the, regarding the Greek debt and the Argentinian debt, it's quite a mess. There is litigation everywhere. It doesn't work properly. So what I could say now, it, maybe there's a step forward. And the step forward is based, is based on a, a very simple uh, 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 statement. Um, when you have a state in default and, uh, and an insolvency risk, there are two existing options. The first one is to negotiate. Then you will accept uh, a, a restructuring. But if you accept the restructuring, if you do not accept the, the restructuring, you can uh, have an all-out strategy, uh, 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 but the all-out strategy which will need uh, uh, you to go to the court, uh, uh, and maybe it will not work. And the, the other option is to litigate. That is the all-out strategy, sorry. And if you litigate by the national court or by investment arbitration, uh, uh, it's very long-standing. Uh, if we see... Uh, the, the BIT uh, cases, uh, uh, um, most of them are still pending. Um, and we, except for Greece, we don't have any a definitive decision. Uh, if you uh, have an overview, uh, you can see that the litigation might be by the international tribunal, it might be by domestic tribunals. Uh, and and, and uh, it takes a lot of time and a lot of money, so it doesn't work properly. And even though you have uh, an award or the judgment, then you have the immunities issue, which uh, could stop the enforcement uh, of the decision. So my uh, proposal here is to uh, find something else. And uh, I, I will uh, be quite quick uh, on this because I see that uh, maybe I'm uh, at the end of, uh, of my time. <laughs> but we have launched an academic project within my previous university, University of Nanterre, um, in 2013, in order to uh, conceive and conceptualize a state insolvency uh, proceeding. 
and we uh, gather uh, a research group with uh, academics and practitioners of uh, public international law, uh, transnational litigation and arbitration law, and financial market law. And the project has been finalized in June 2015. It is published in French in the Journal du Droit International, and the English version is in the Exit Review, and we also have a dedicated uh, website uh, uh, which uh, you can uh, go to, of course. The, the general overview of the project, so the title is International Center for the Financial Safeguard of States, and we, we've drafted two texts, a multilateral treaty and a conciliation arbitration rules. Um, so that's what we've done within the, the research group. We've drafted this text, and you can find this with, uh, either on the website or in the exit review or in the, in the Journal du Droit International. Um, the main characteristic of the pressing we've, uh, we, 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 we are proposing is a, a two-step mechanism. The first, me first step is a conciliation phase with, between the state and the bond holders. It's a mechanism that is uh, focusing on, on, on the bond market uh, with a conciliator and eventually uh, some experts. And if the conciliation f phase does not work, then you go to arbitration. So for us, arbit the arbitration phase is seen as an incentive to negotiate within the conciliation phase. Um, so it's a midway between the contractual 100% uh, contractual approach and the institutional approach. Uh, it's not a 100%, let's say, international insolvency tribunal. It's a midway between that and the collective action clause, I must say. Um, and the, the, the aim of the whole proceeding, uh, being the co within the conciliation phase or being within the arbitration phase, is not to properly litigate like what we see within the exceed, for example. It's the adoption of a debt restructuring plan um, by way of conciliation or the by way of a decision of the arbitrator. So as you said, the scope of jurisdiction is quite narrow. It's uh, uh, to, uh, only to, uh, to modify the bonds and, uh, and to adopt a, a restructuring uh, a restructuring plan. Um, we also have introduced some specific provision uh, in order to grant the, the, the jurisdiction of the of the center in order to uh, to stop uh, any old out strategies uh, in order to uh, have a mechanism which uh, is uh, can uh, uh, make all the bond owners being represented uh, within the mechanism. And we have also some provision um, regarding the restructuring plan implementation, and especially the, the, the immunity uh, issue uh, with, a, with a specific waiver. Um, this mechanism, hopefully, is now in a, a quite favorable context. Uh, why? First of all, because you have this old project of the IMF uh, beginning in 2002-2003, uh, which has been abandoned at the end by the IMF, but in recent uh, report from the IMF, which is called the, sorry, the ESGRM, um, re in recent report of the, of the IMF, uh, the IMS is talking about an, uh, again, sorry, about this uh, this uh, SDRM, and the second uh, um, uh, favorable uh, context uh, point is that within the UN you had this uh, ad hoc committee on sovereign debt restructuring, uh, which uh, in fact was not a real success uh, uh, from my point of view, but it did exist. Uh, as a conclusion, uh, I mention here uh, something that has been said in a brief uh, from the French government 
to, to, the, to the, the, the United Kingdom government and focusing on the rebondsment of France's uh, public debt. And as you said, it's in 1931. And as you say, which is interesting within this, uh, this brief, is that um, within this, uh, this text between two, uh, two countries, two states, it is expressly said that when you're talking about sovereign debt, you cannot talk about arbitration. You cannot submit a sovereign debt problem by international arbitration. But that was in 1931, and maybe now the time has changed, and then uh, it's possible that we could have a different opinion. In fact, we do have already, because uh, we see that with the, with the ICSID uh, and, and BIT-based uh, 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 proceeding that exists already. Uh, we could now maybe have something as a, a, an insolvency uh, uh, international proceeding, which uh, could take the best from arbitration in order to have uh, a coherent, uh, uh, um, uh, restructured uh, process, uh, plan adoption uh, when the state is insolvent. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, okay, G good evening, everyone. And uh, of course, I would like to, to thank uh, Ellen uh, Rees Fabry, uh, director of the Max Planck Institute, for her kind invitation. Uh, it has really been a long time I haven't had the chance to, to see you, and thank you for having us. It's such a nice setting. It's really the first time that I have three different categories of drink that are available on the table, so it's, it's, it's really impressive. I'm even wondering whether I have the possibility of taking the iPad at the end of the conference. No, <laughs> maybe we will see. Um, I'd like to thank also um, Sabrina Logrio, uh, who was really helpful for, for everything, for the preparation of, of my travel and my stay here in, um, in Luxembourg, and I'm happy to, to meet for the first time Professor Bukad Hess uh, as well, who is co-director of, of the Institute. Uh, thank you also for inviting me uh, and giving me the opportunity to, to discuss some of the issues that Matthias has, has raised in his presentation, uh, which was extremely uh, rich and um, insightful. Um, I, I'm not going to discuss his, his proposal that he mentioned at the end of his presentation regarding the creation of the Center for the Financial Savior of States. It's a, it's a project to which I contributed very, very modestly when I was uh, at Nanterre with, uh, with him. Um, um, of course, I'm a little bit skeptical about the political feasibility of uh, the project and the possibility for states to accept such a project, but I think this is really one of the most sophisticated, most serious uh, projects that we have to, today on the table if we just have a look at other projects that are purely incantatory. Um, so, um, instead of discussing this project, I'd like to, to offer another perspective on the question that have been raised, I would say a, a complementary perspective uh, on, on what has been discussed uh, previously. Uh, so, sorry for the very tiny slides. Uh, I <laughs> probably think that you won't be able to read uh, anything. Um, I, I just wanted to... Um, to, to discuss uh, in the first place um, and to introduce a kind of mapping of uh, sovereign debt uh, litigation because I, I do really think that in fact it is somehow the quintessential uh, research topic for the Institute mixing public and private international law issues, um, exploring the wonders of, of international litigation, uh, exploring uh, some specific procedural issues such as mass claim arbitration and testing also the limits of some unregulated areas of uh, international law. Um, um, in, in, in the first mapping, uh, and there is also a second one, the second one focuses more on execution issues, the first one focuses more on um, uh, merits uh, issues. So, um, disputes basically concerning solely the restructuring uh, process and uh, the responsibility 
um, deriving from uh, these uh, res um, restructuring processes. Uh, so we have, uh, as Mathias said, and I'm be, uh, I will be, uh, of course, a little bit faster on, on those issues that have already been introduced, you have litigation between the issuer and the bond order for breach of contract. And you see the difference here between the um, Greek case, where there was no um, forum selection clause in the bonds, uh, without any waiver of immunity from jurisdiction and even execution. Um, and basically, uh, the contract claim was not extremely successful. Uh, then you have cases related to Argentina with uh, a forum selection clause, with a waiver of immunity from jurisdiction and from execution. And you, in fact, you have, I would say, two categories of claims. Non-payment, it's the 2006 decision. And um, proceeding not related directly to the payment, but um, consisting in harassing the um, other bondholders that accepted, who accepted uh, the restructuring uh, process. And you have also extraterritorial injunctions on which Matthias has published many, uh, many articles. Uh, then you have um, a second category of litigation, litigation um, between bondholders and the debtor states. Uh, for, uh, not for non-performance of contract, but for uh, a sovereign decision affecting contractual rights. And in that category, we can put um, the Hellenic Council of State decision of 2014. Uh, all, I would say, uh, investment uh, claims, uh, abaclat with the Italian bondholders and so on and so forth. And uh, the European Court of Human Rights recent decision in July 2013, because all those uh, litigations uh, revolve around the same ID, interference with property rights, interference with uh, legitimate uh, expectations. So it could be Article 1 of Additional Protocol 1 of the European Court of Human Rights, it could be uh, the um, right to property protected under the uh, Greek constitution, it could be expropriation under investment arbitration, basically it's almost the same thing. Then you have the very specific litigation related to um, the extra contractual liability of uh, the uh, European Central Bank, uh, a case uh, involving, uh, just like in Abaclat, uh, also uh, Italian citizens. Um, uh, so basically, if there's one, I would say, lesson to draw from this litigation is that you should never follow uh, the investment advice of an Italian bondholder because they were involved both in the uh, Greek and uh, the Argentine um, restructuring uh, processes. Then we had another potential international litigation that didn't um, succeed. Uh, because um, Argentina introduced a claim before the International Court of Justice in August 2014 through the, what we call the Forum Prorogatum, um, claiming that uh, US court decisions basically uh, were contrary to um, uh, certain norms of international law related mostly to sovereign immunity. And, of course, uh, the US uh, denied, uh, declined, and basically didn't say anything about the claim that, that was raised by uh, Argentina. Uh, then we have a second category of disputes, and Matthias already discussed uh, a lot about those, uh, those issues, uh, related to uh, execution. So litigation before domestic courts related to measures of execution, I'll say, uh, a word about this later on. There is one decision that is not extremely well known, taken by the French Court de Cassation, uh, related to the possibility for the satisfaction of uh, the money judgment to seize the assets, not of Argentina, but of a territorial subdivision of Argentina here, the Provincia del Chubut. And uh, the Court de Cassation in 2014 basically said no, uh, not because it conducted really a very in-depth analysis of who is uh, the debtor, but because simply it said, well, uh, on the judgment I have Argentina, on the asset the, the, the owner is Provincia de Chubut, it's not the same, I, I cannot do anything. But if we consider that a state um, borrow money with, uh, on, the, on the international market, uh, waive its immunity for, uh, from execution, would it be possible to conceive that basically a it is a kind of international commitment of a state at the international level? So would it be possible to conceive that uh, the state should be regarded as a black box and cannot uh, possibly um, 
uh, invoke its domestic law, so the separation of uh, the, the legal persons of the state and of the um, um, territorial subdivision in order to circumvent its kind of international uh, liability, uh, responsibility, um, I would say. Um, then we have the um, case before the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, so interstate litigation initiated by the debtor state against the state whose courts have approved the seizure of uh, debtor assets. I say a word uh, about this later. And then uh, the litigation mentioned by Matthias, initiated by a creditor against the state whose courts have refused the seizure of the debtor assets because of immunity of execution. So it was a claim based on Article 6 of the uh, European Convention of Human Rights, right to fair trial, which basically include the right uh, of um, um, the right of execution, the right to execution of uh, of domestic uh, decisions. Um, as Matthias said, uh, the court uh, denied uh, the claim, basically by saying, "Well, you have a domestic remedy at the domestic level; it's the responsibility of the state." I think that basically uh, the um, uh, European Court of Human Rights was not very comfortable with, uh, with this issue uh, because we had a waiver of uh, immunity from execution. It would have been extremely complicated for the European Court considering its growing jurisprudence case law on um, uh, sovereign immunity to consider that it should not have any, uh, any effect. And just like Matthias, I really think that uh, it will be impossible for the French Council of State to say, well, okay, the French state is going to pay 1 billion euros to NML. Uh, I mean, now the case is settled, so it's over, but <laughs> it would have been, in my view, completely inconceivable. Um, so, um, other issues I would like to, to discuss. Uh, uh, it's even smaller. <laughs> I'm just wondering where we're going to end. <laughs> um, uh, okay, I think it's time to maybe um, uh, forward the PDF presentation through email if you have this possibility. Otherwise, it's going to be a little bit complex. Um, first issue, uh, the question of the quest of, for objectivity in, in sovereign debt uh, litigation. Um, we have very different uh, cases if we compare uh, Argentinian claim and, um, claims and uh, claims related to the um, Greek uh, restructuring. We have different uh, structure, legal structures, uh, claims in, in, in domestic law, for instance, in, um, uh, in, in, in um, the Argentinian case. Uh, in both cases, we may nonetheless wonder whether... Um, um, it would have been possible for both courts, I mean, the um, US court in the Paris Passu claim and uh, the uh, European Court of Human Rights to um, uh, incorporate into their reasoning, um, I would say, objectives of general interest. Uh, is it possible to objectivate the dispute? In the contractual claim, and I think it is, very, it is really because of the very structure of the claim and because it's a contract claim, um, before domestic court, uh, there, there have been some attempts uh, to um, um, suggest uh, to, to Judge Greza that it's not just a contract, uh, that when it comes to Paris Passu litigation, it may have an effect on holdouts at the international level, it may have an effect on other restructuring processes, and this is, because, uh, and this is why uh, the U.S. Department of Treasury and uh, Department of State, uh, the French state, uh, Anne Kruger, uh, the former IMF official who was at the origin of the SDIM um, um, project, uh, they all submitted an uh, amicus curiae brief to Judge Griza uh, in order to take into consideration those aspects. And for instance, the American brief stated uh, the effect of a decision, so the way you're going to interpret uh, basically the Paris Passu clause, could extend well beyond Argentina. If creditors adopt this strategy, foreign sovereign debt restructuring will become impossible. And those overarching objectives, I would say, of sovereign debt restructuring were not taken into consideration by uh, Judge uh, Griesa. Uh, then, um, uh, this question also arose in the context of the European Court of Human Rights uh, decision of 2016, July 2016 for Greece. Um, so, uh, beyond the fact that 
whether or not Greece pursue uh, an objective of uh, um, or legitimate objective uh, within the framework of the restructuring. Um, there is one element uh, that could be discussed: um, the proportionality of the interference. Uh, and there are one specific paragraph in which the uh, European Court of Human Rights basically said, well, um, um, for the restructuring process, Greece uh, did not use any kind of instrument. It relied upon collective action clauses that are heavily recognized at the international level, that are incorporated and no mandatory under the ESM Treaty of 2012, uh, that uh, are a widespread practice known on the international markets, and so on and so forth. So somehow, um, um, the European Court of Human Rights said, when it comes to the proportionality of interference, um, Greece used a legitimate instrument, a kind of objective instrument. The question that we may raise, and the question that could possibly uh, be raised later on, if, for instance, France defaults on its debt or other countries without, um, uh, in, the, in the future, uh, would the decision of the European Court of Human Rights be the same uh, if it would not have been possible for Greece to incorporate a CAC, uh, a collective action clause, uh, because uh, it was possible only because the, um, um, the Greek bonds were subject to Greek law. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't have been possible. What would have been, what would be possibly the, I would say, the um, uh, the, uh, the decision of the European Court of Human Rights in this uh, very specific situation. Uh, second question I would like to address, um, perhaps two issues concerning sovereign debt in uh, investment arbitration. Um, Matthias has raised many um, elements regarding um, uh, the questionable qualification of sovereign debt as um, an investment. And of course, uh, it is true that we may wonder whether it is really for Argentina, for instance, an investment made, made on the territory of a state, if it is uh, really an instrument contributing to the development of a state, uh, whether secondary market uh, investors are really investors. Uh, but on this point, we may also say that uh, the primary purchaser may not exist if he knows that there is no secondary purchaser at the same time. So basically, I, I do agree with you, but I'm, I'm really wondering whether um, um, it's, it's really interesting, I, I would say, to, to discuss in depth those issues, because the notion of investment um, as developed by exit tribunals has been developed uh, in, in so many ways with judicial activism that, in my view today, it's not really far-fetched to say, well, a bond, uh, a sovereign bond can be regarded as an investment under, for instance, Article 25 of uh, uh, the Exit Convention. So, uh, of course, it's an issue, but I really do think, as you mentioned in your presentation, that uh, it's the inadequacy of, of, uh, of the forum, of the Exit Forum, to, to, to discuss and settle sovereign debt issues when they're related to restructuring process. Uh, we could have different options um, that are open to the states, for instance, in the India model BIT or in the Colombia model BIT, they just consider in the definition of investment that, well, it's not covered. Rationé Materie, the BIT um, does not apply to um, uh, public, public debt instruments, bonds or, or others. Um, uh, what did the EU um, do in CETA, uh, in a highly contested uh, CETA? Um, the EU did not, um, uh, ha hasn't decided to uh, raise the issue of um, the definition of investment, but rather decided to consider that uh, it was a matter of admissibility of claims. And this is something that is uh, addressed in Article 8.18.5 of CETA, um, uh, leading to Annex 8b. Uh, what does Annex 8b say? Well, basically, uh, point two, no claim that a restructuring of debt of a party breaches an obligation of CETA. So the case is not admissible if it refers to a restructuring process. And what is a restructuring process? And in my, in my view, it's extremely interesting to, to read the first uh, paragraph of this um, article. 
Um, a modification or amendment of debt as provided for under their terms, so collective action clause, including their governing law, collective action clause inserted retroactively, just like Greece. It could be also a debt exchange or other similar process in which the holders of no less than 75% of the aggregate principal amount uh, of the outstanding debt subject to restructuring and so on and so forth. This is the Argentinian cases, a case. No uh, collective action clause, but unilateral restructuring accepted by more than 75% of uh, the um, uh, bondholders. So with this kind of clause, it would have been impossible to have um, uh, cases uh, before exits, uh, exit just like those that were basically mentioned by, um, uh, by Matthias. Uh, another element I would like to, to mention, uh, it's really not comfortable, <laughs> I would say, even, even for me, um, is um, can we consider that um, investment arbitration has some weaknesses? Uh, and I'm only dealing with uh, the Argentinian case, not the Greek case, because for Greece, we had the litigation in Germany, it didn't work. Uh, I think it's the only possible venue for, for ball unders and holdouts, to, I would say, to challenge the, uh, the Greek uh, decision, the Greek restructuring process. Um, uh, it, exit arbitration could be interesting to the extent that uh, it could be part of a broader harassment, procedural harassment strategy, and we had an agreement between uh, Greece and Abaclad bondholder in uh, uh, April 2016. Um, it could be interesting to the extent that once you have an exit award, uh, it should be automatically recognized at uh, the domestic level. So if you compare, for instance, uh, an exit award and a decision um, of a New York court, uh, for instance, in the NML case, with the NML case, you could be subject to an anti venter fund sta uh, statute, I would say, uh, blocking the recognition of the decision. It's not possible under the exit. So somehow it's kind of a privilege of an exit world compared with a domestic court decision that needs to be recognized, executed in another form. Uh, but when it comes to um, sovereign, uh, immunity from execution, uh, under Article 55 of uh, the um, Exit Convention, we do not have any waiver of immunity uh, from uh, execution. And for instance, at this stage, it's perhaps more interesting for a bondholder to have a New York judgment related directly to the contract that includes um, this type of um, sovereign of waiver. Uh, so, I'm not sure that Exceed is really interesting for, for bondholders. It worked in the Abaclad case, uh, but at the same time, we must keep in mind that um, the Abaclad case was fully organized not by bondholders, but by um, Italian financial institutions uh, who were involved in um, uh, the distribu distribution of financial products, including um, uh, Argentinian uh, bonds, and those financial institutions basically uh, feared that they were going to be um, uh, to be uh, sued before Italian courts uh, for bad investment advice. So they said, "Oh no, 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 no! <laughs> Please <laughs> uh, do not sue us. Uh, we are never going to reimburse you. But I will package something like an exit arbitration for you, and you will see it, it's going to work well." In this case, somehow it works. Um, uh, uh, the last issue on which I would like to, um, to, to say a few things is um, the adverse effects of, of sovereign debt litigation on sovereign immunity. Uh, the question I would like to raise is um, whether or not we should consider that uh, sovereign immunity is a relevant instrument to regulate the sovereign debt process. I do not have a feeling that sovereign immunity, immunity from execution, has been created as an instrument of regulation of sovereign debt, but it was used so by many uh, domestic and uh, international courts. Uh, there's one um, uh, distinction um, that is important in my view, is the distinction of how should we interpret sovereign immunity from execution, um, 
absence or in presence of a waiver uh, of uh, immunity from execution. When you do not have a waiver of immunity from uh, execution, and referring to the UN Convention on Jurisdictional Immunities of States, uh, you in the situation of Article 19C that uh, everyone can read very clearly uh, here. Uh, basically, you have a possibility of targeting the assets uh, that the state use. There's a double negation in uh, the um, Article 9, uh, 19C, so I try to sum up. That the state use for, I would say, commercial or private purposes. And Article 21 lists uh, the categories of assets not having commercial and private purposes. So, for instance, uh, assets of uh, property of military character, property of a central bank, uh, property forming part of the cultural heritage of a state, and so on and so forth. So, basically, it means that those assets could be targeted if you have, if you benefit from a waiver of immunity from uh, execution. And this distinction must be kept in mind. I think it's, it's really important. Um, uh, regarding the um, International Tribunal of Law of the Sea uh, dispute and uh, the um, order delivered by the court in 2012, um, uh, we, we can discuss whether uh, the conditions for a uh, provisional measure order, the existence, for instance, of a risk of real and imminent risk of irreparable prejudice did exist at the time. Uh, what is interesting, in my view, is the fact that the International Tribula, uh, tr Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, it laws, never considered the existence and the potential effect of the weather. The fact that Ghanaian courts recognized the effect of the waiver of immunity from uh, execution, and that they basically enforced the waiver. It was absolutely not discussed. The International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea basically said, it's a worship, immunity, boom. Um, another consequence, uh, we, can, we can witness another consequence in uh, domestic cases, uh, that were mentioned already by Matthias. Um, the fact that uh, it's the case of Belgian courts, it's the case of French courts, have somehow generated a, a new condition for uh, the effectiveness of the waiver of immunity from execution. If you read Article 19 of the Convention, well, basically it's not <laughs> extremely interesting, <laughs> forget this, uh, the waiver must be express. And uh, the uh, court, French Court de Cassation in 2013 basically said, no, the waiver must be express and it must be at the same time specific. So you must list the assets for which you have decided to waive your immunity from uh, execution. Uh, this decision was heavily criticized by the doctrine. And in 2015, in the Commis Simpex versus Congo, uh, the uh, French Court de Cassation basically said, no, it must be only express. It does not need to be specific. But 2015, UCOS award, new enforcement measures um, initiated by NML. So we cannot rely on the case law of Court de Cassation. We have to adopt a new law. So, Loi saint 2 mentioned by uh, Mathias uh, um, before uh, the Belgium Statute in 2015. And in fact, we, we can witness a kind of reluctance of states uh, to consider that it is legitimate to, to enforce a decision against a state and to seize state assets. And this is something, for instance, that you can uh, witness in the Belgium Statute if you, if you read the bill, was drafted as a, a bill regulating the seizure of goods belonging to a foreign power. It's really a 19th uh, century uh, vocabulary at a time where uh, basically we had uh, an absolute sovereign immunity, sovereign power, not a so sovereign power, uh, a foreign power, it's even worse. So basically I, I would say that this litigation is a one-way ticket to the 19th century um, conception of, um, of state immunity. And uh, the fact that we now have two 
uh, conditions, it must be expressed, it must be specific. It's, it's not in line with international customary law, it's not in line with UN Convention of 2014. And we may wonder, for instance, when the convention is going to be enforced, because we have 21 or 22 states who have ratified the convention, we need 30 states to be it enforced. Uh, what is going to be the interpretation of judges, for instance, in France, because uh, we have a supra-legislative value for the convention, so is it going to supersede the, the statute, the Sapin 2 uh, statute or not? Uh, is it in full compliance with Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights? Um, um, does it, um, uh, is it possible to criticize this rule considering the fact that uh, it affects uh, legitimate expectations stemming from contracts because you have changes related to the applicable law of a contract uh, which included a waiver and which was concluded like 20 years ago? So this is, of course, a... Uh, an important, um, uh, in my view, argument. And uh, should we proceed through negative list? So basically say we have a waiver from immunity, of immunity from execution, and we're just going to, to list uh, the assets that cannot be um, uh, seized, or uh, as suggested by uh, the law, should we have positive list? So you will be able to seize this type of asset, this type of asset, this type of asset. If we... Um, 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 uh, proceed through a uh, positive list, I mean, in a negotiation of contract between state and uh, bondholders, it's going to be impossible. You cannot list all the assets, even all the categories of assets that could be possibly seized in, uh, in the future. And if we have a look at the last uh, Argentinian uh, offering memorandum, um, so um, issue of bonds of April 2016, uh, just before the settlement with NML, so basically they raised money in order to pay the holdout creditors, um, Argentina proceed with a negative list. Uh, so we waive our immunity from execution except for reserves of central bank, uh, diplomatic property, uh, property of a military character. Basically you have all the disputes uh, involving NML and Argentina uh, in, in, in different countries in, um, in this clause. And it went even further, uh, up. it went further, um, because uh, the, the Council of Europe uh, adopted in uh, September 2016 a declaration on jurisdictional immunity of state-owned cultural property, basically saying uh, cultural property is protected. So the declaration was endorsed by many states of the Council of Europe. Um, cultural property is, um, is protected. Um, uh, there could be measure of constraint only if immunity is, so it's uh, what, is, what is in bold here, is expressly waived for a clearly specified property. So you could you imagine that in a contract, uh, we're going to have, for instance, Russia basically saying, well, um, I do waive my immunity uh, from execution for uh, the Russian Orthodox Church uh, located Quai Branly in Paris. Uh, I mean, it's of course not... Uh, not conceivable, and countries perfectly know that while adopting uh, this uh, declaration, that in none of their current contracts uh, they have weighed their immunity from execution for specific uh, property. And so what's the next step, I would say, in this transformation of international law? It's an emerging uh, doctrine claiming that we should consider that there is a nullity of waivers of sovereign immunity. Uh, you have some uh, articles uh, supporting that claim. And basically, it reminds me um, uh, the issue of unconscionability of arbitration in consumer contracts. We have the impression that the state is a poor tiny thing that needs to be protected. Uh, and. Uh, in my, in my view, it, it really takes the, the, the wrong direction. So, uh, some thoughts about, uh, about the topic. Uh, I really think that uh, sovereign debt litigation has, has not left, um, has not left uh, international law uh, intact. Thank you very much. So thank you very much to, to you both, and thank you especially to Regis for improving our, 
vision of things. And uh, I will uh, immediately open, uh, open the floor just to recall before that my fellow director, Burkhard Hess, is a great specialist of immunities. And <laughs> all along your speech, he has <laughs> shared his thought with me. First to Matthias. <laughs> So I would like to join Elaine in thanking you for these two very stimulating presentations. And uh, I would like to take up uh, three points. One is the most general one. When listening to your presentations, your mapping of the different disputes, the different fora, etc., one might come to the conclusion it's a choice of the private investor where to go, to domestic courts, to international tribunals, are there nevertheless some institutions, instruments, which delineate both? We are talking about uh, sovereign immunity. We are talking about uh, exhaustion of uh, local remedies. So maybe there are some rules within uh, international law, uh, also private international law, which uh, may give more guidance. We have a very uh, hard litigation, or we had a very hard litigation, especially in New York, but not only. Uh, for me, the most, and this is my second point here, um, the most, uh, con my, my main concern was the way how the American court also addressed third parties, not only the claimants and Argentina, but also banks where accounts of Argentina were located, um, even in Euro, Clearstream, uh, were targeted by uh, these uh, uh, injunctions. And I found this was really a case where we were close to harassment. I was wondering to what extent these injunctions could be recognized, but the old problem arises again here. It's not about recognition, because all these actors are also in the US, and so they are subject to the direct uh, arm of the American court. So I think this is something we should really have in mind that this uh, kind of litigation transgresses the old uh, setting uh, between states and uh, uh, private litigants. And finally, I would like to come back to state immunity, of course. Um, there are very interesting judgments concerning uh, the Greek bonds in different European countries. You both mentioned uh, the judgment of the, the German Supreme Civil Court, which uh, to my opinion is not the strongest uh, judgment the court has ever rendered. Um, just to take it up, uh, the Austrian court, Supreme Court, gave two judgments uh, a couple of months ago where the court simply said, no, this is a contractual dispute. And uh, there has been a contract. And uh, when it comes to the merits, of course, we have to consider which law applies. To what extent can we also consider the Greek law on the, uh, on the collective actions, um, or collective clauses, and collective action clauses. Now I'm saying it correctly. And uh, if we take up the Nicofiridis judgment of the Court of Justice, which was given almost two weeks ago, which was about uh, an employment contract of a Greek teacher in Germany teaching, teaching at a Greek school and who lost large parts of his salary because the Greek state simply applied the Greek law to the salary of this teacher. And the Court of Justice said, no, this is not a parentary mandatory norm under the Rome 1 regulation, Article 9.3, but nevertheless, when it comes to the applicable German law, German law provides for some devices to, let's say, respect this decision of the Greek state. So maybe state immunity from a perspective of private international law seems to me not to be the right point to, to shield states, international institutions from civil litigation. Maybe a solution in the context of private international law is much more balanced and better, but this is a very specific point. Otherwise, it is up to the claimant how to formulate a claim to make it contractual or tortious or delictual in order to overcome state immunity, and this cannot be the case. 
Je sais pas. <rire> Vas-y, je t'en prie. Euh... Je ne suis pas sûr d'avoir réponse à tout. Je ne suis pas sûr d'avoir réponse à tout. Je ne suis pas sûr d'avoir réponse à tout. Je vais essayer. Je vais commencer avec le second point. Je vais commencer avec le second point, si vous ne voulez pas. La seconde question regarding l'extraterritorialité. En fait, oui. Um, I have, uh, I have um, drafted some, some articles regarding this uh, extraterritoriality of the retailable payment. And, uh, and um, um, I was amazed, maybe uh, just, just to give the, 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 the world picture. So the, the Juge Grieza has issued this uh, uh, retailable payment I've been mentioned during my speech. Uh, but this retailable payment injunction is uh, addressed to the parties, of course, but in fact, to everybody, uh, to the banks, to the, the clearing chambers, uh, to the lawyers. Uh, so, and that, that, the, the first point I, 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 I was uh, very surprised of is that um, you will never see that by a French court, actually, to have such an injunction which has uh, uh, an application field which is uh, far beyond the, 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 the litigators. Uh, uh, I, I, then, I imagine that it's quite the same in, in Germany or in civil countries, maybe even in the UK. Uh, um, but with this, uh, the, so you can see the power of a US judge, which is very strong and stronger than, a, than a, maybe than a civil, a civil law judge. And the second point is the extraterritoriality of, uh, of this injunction. Because the Juge Grieza was saying, uh, you cannot, um, uh, you have to respect the retable payment, even though you are clearing chamber uh, in Belgium, for example, or in Luxembourg. Uh, 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 you, you, have to, you have to do that, uh, because if you do not do that, that would be a contempt of court, uh, and the contempt of court could uh, uh, lead to a criminal sanctions, and uh, if you uh, if you're a bank, it could lead for not doing any more business in the United States, which is very difficult, of course, for, for a bank account. So um, uh, they had you had some some uh, some cases in Belgium and in the UK in order to avoid this uh, extraterritoriality, but uh, but at the end of the day, it worked quite well, I must say. And uh, even though, uh, I mean, from a public international perspective, uh, it might be highly debatable to have uh, a judicial injunction issued by the US judge which could apply to anyone which is not party to the litigation uh, and uh, uh, wherever it is uh, uh, on, on, on the, uh, in the world. Um, Regarding the first questions, the first question, uh, in fact, at the beginning, it's 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 a, it's a simple contractual litigation, but has um, it's very difficult to obtain something on the ground of the contract uh, for the for the holders for the bond holders. Uh, that's why the other. Uh, these other uh, legal grounds have been tried. Uh, the, these these other uh, venues, as you said, has been tried. Uh, uh, international responsibility or European responsibility. Uh, uh, that, that the, the main reason is because the, 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 the normal and usual contractual litigation didn't work. Uh, or it's very difficult to obtain decision. I don't know if there is rules that might uh, let's say, uh, govern the decision of going to, uh, to a contractual litigation or to a tort, responsibility, a tort litigation, but uh, I think it's more uh, a decision of, uh, a factual decision, uh, taking into account that you, it's very difficult to obtain something on the ground of the, of the contract. And regarding the third point, uh, I didn't know about this Australian decision, actually. Um, and I'd be very interested to <laughs> have them. <laughs> um, um, uh, so it's quite difficult for me to, and I don't know how the, the decision regarding the, 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 the Greek teacher, the Greek, uh, so um, 
So, so, so the Greek, the Greek decision, the, the Greek teacher decision is a, is a German decision, or it's Australian as well. Of the court of justice. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So, so it's difficult for me to comment as I don't know either the, the Australian and the <laughs> European court of justice decision. Uh, yes, um, <laughs> I won't comment as well the Austrian decision and uh, this European Court of Justice decision because uh, basically you mentioned Article 9.3, so I, just take, uh, I suggest that you are talking about somehow a Brussels regulation, perhaps, or ah, okay, no, because <laughs> not really <it's> <laughs> okay. <laughs> in private international law, so um, I, I don't think that I have the expertise to, to, to reply on this, even though uh, from the outside we have a feeling that. Um, uh, the way the German court has uh, comprehended uh, the, um, uh, the dispute uh, could be somehow a little bit artificial. Uh, the very fact that, uh, no, uh, it's not the decision of a state not to um, um, uh, execute the contract, but it's a decision of the same state to change the regulation governing the contract. So some, somehow, it's, I, I do agree with you, it's artificial, so it's debatable, but it implies, I think, a, a kind of private international decision for which I, I, I do not have any kind of, um, uh, of expertise. Um, uh, going back to your points, um, I do really think that uh, at the very beginning of the uh, Argentinian cases, uh, it, it was really, this, this, this dispute, the Argentinian dispute was really a, a matter of law. And I really think that um, uh, the uh, all that investors, they read the contract, they say, well, we have a uh, waiver for um, immunity from uh, uh, jurisdiction, uh, we have a, a golden clause uh, waiver of immunity from execution, so it's, it's going to work, it's going to work. And um, uh, from a matter of law, I think it became a matter of fact. They, they've noticed that uh, through the traditional legal process, you have a claim, you have a money judgment, you enforce your money judgment, it's not going to work. Uh, and uh, this is why it became, um, I would say, a procedural har harassment against Argentina. Um, not to enforce the judgment, but to prevent Argentina from um, being on the international markets. Uh, even the provinces of Argentina, because for instance in 2015, uh, uh, Holdout and ML um, um, requested the um, um, seizure of bonds issued in Paris uh, by the province of Buenos Aires. So, okay, you don't pay us, so we are going to do anything we can in order to make sure that you, we will have a settlement. And basically, I think this is a kind of legal strategy that um, is no longer sustainable, I mean, in a, simply in the legal sphere, but as a matter of having, a, as leveraging your bargaining power, basically. Uh, and it's a matter of fact for this. Uh, it's a matter of fact also for uh, when it comes to, um, but in a different way for when it comes to extraterritorial injection uh, delivered by uh, the U.S. court. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's the same thing in every field. It's the same thing in the um, FCPA uh, disputes. It's the same thing in um, U.S. sanctioned uh, program um, cases. Extraterritoriality works when you have the power. When you have a very important, significant forum through which many important, sensitive uh, economic actors have to go through. And you may subject them to your decision. So it's no longer a matter of law. It, it may be, of course, it's questionable uh, regarding some public international law principles and this kind of stuff, but it's a matter of force for US courts. It's, it's not really a matter of law, I think. Thank you. Um, First, uh, I would like to start with the most important question. Um, you mentioned the arbitration procedure, but the question is, uh, what is what are the criteria going to be for the arbiters? So on what basis are they going to judge whether they're dealing with odious debt, uh, whether the country is still able to pay, whether it should increase uh, its um, taxation, whether government assets should be sold? So somebody needs to decide 
the sustainability of debt, and then the question is who's going to get the haircut. So uh, if you could comment about the substance of the suggested process. Uh, second issue, um, when there is a war, typically you have the seizure of enemy alien property. Why was that never attempted? Uh, for instance, uh, creditors of Greece could have been tempted to go after Greek ship owners uh, living in uh, abundance in London. Um, going after their assets, uh, claiming a legal theory that uh, people are responsible for the debt of their sovereign states. Um, you also mentioned uh, very briefly that there was a potential of litigation versus banks, but what about litigation versus rating agencies, because they helped sell those bonds. Uh, and of course there could be a doctrine of liability against the states concerned because they themselves could have committed fraud when uh, issuing the prospectus by uh, illustrating their financial situation in a much rosier way than would have been warranted. And just a final point regarding the vulture funds, um, the discrimination between vulture funds and bona fide investors in the secondary market seems to be a bit vague, but uh, there's an easy way for vulture funds to avoid being tarnished. They could, instead of buying uh, debt, turn themselves into litigation financiers which means they would provide the funding for litigation and they would then take a 30% haircut of whatever the proceeds would be, but the litigant would remain the original Italian uh, small bondholder. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I'm, I think I, I, you, you pointed, you pointed uh, f there's four points. The first one is regarding the, I, I, uh, I, I understand that you, you you're talking about the the, the process we've suggested the, um, the criteria for the arbitration uh, when deciding or imposing a solution. Okay, uh, we we did mention a, uh, within the um, within the the, the proposed uh, treaty there is a, a disposition uh, um, uh, regarding the applicable uh, principle law principle uh, for the arbitrators. And that that would be um, public international law, but we also inserted uh, a, a disposition saying that the arbitrators should take into account um, the, the the financial situation of the state and the rights of the citizens. So our idea is I, I I'm sorry I don't have um, uh, in mind. Uh, the, in mind, the, 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 the exact uh, redaction of the disposition, but I can uh, give it to you. Uh, but, but the idea is, when, when judging, when adopting the, the, the restrictor, restrict, so I'm a bit tired, <laughs> speaking English for such a long time, um, the restructuring plan, um, they have to take into account, uh, let's say, uh, 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 citizen rights of the debtor states, uh, uh, and at the end of the day, I mean, it's a restructuration process, so there will be an arcade if the arbitrator thinks that that's the good solution. So there will be an arcade, and the the arcade will be uh, uh, um, uh, on the, on the head of the of the of the creditors, of course. Uh, um, and, and that would be uh, 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 any creditor participating to the process. Uh, regarding the second point, I do not see any legal ground by which you could, uh, let's say, if I do understand what you said, uh, you could uh, 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 have a claim against a Greek citizen uh, holding assets in uh, in somewhere or having uh, uh, real estates in the in the UK uh, 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 when you are bondholders of of of, of Greek bonds. Uh, I, I don't know, I do not see how you can do that. Um, but that's so that, so no I I I, I cannot see that. Sec third point is rating agencies. Uh, you have. And now you have a, a, a European regulation regarding uh, rating agencies with a specific uh, uh, tort regime uh, for rating agencies. So it's uh, it's settled by the by the, by the EU, and uh, and you can uh, have a rating agency uh, being sued uh, for not having uh, doing uh, their job properly for conflict of interest and things like that. Uh, and of course, this 
is the case for, for sovereign rating or corporate rating, uh, any kind of rating. Uh, maybe you could add also uh, banks, uh, and especially one bank, quite famous, which did help uh, uh, the Greek states to, let's say, um, we are filming, are we? Um, so let's say to uh, organize uh, the, 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 the Greek uh, account. And it might be something to do on this one, but it hasn't been uh, done from, from what I know. And regarding the vulture funds, I mean, vulture fund is not a legal concept. Uh, vulture funds are hedge funds. Uh, hedge funds which, uh, which are specialized in uh, distressed debt. And, uh, but it's very difficult to, to have a, a legal definition of vulture fund. The only attempt, from my point of view, is what, what has been done with the, with the Belgium law. But, uh, but it's really f difficult. Uh, if you see the Argentinian case, uh, for uh, regarding the Paris Passu case, I mean, the main winner is a vulture fund uh, called uh, NML Capital. But you have a French bank which has done exactly the same than uh, NML, and that means that the French bank did not participate to the restructuring process, did brought uh, the bond on the secondary market for a very uh, low price, and at the end of the of the process, uh, obtain. Uh, quite a lot uh, uh, by, by by settling with the, with Argentina, uh, so and that was a very well-known bank. So is this bank a vulture fund or not? Well, I mean the 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 the, the way they deal with this uh, issue was uh, exactly the same than what uh, what a hedge fund would do, and uh, of course, well. That could be a new business for Vulture Fund, what you've said. I've been uh, financing uh, litigation uh, without, be, without, without uh, being in, uh, in, in front. Uh, uh, that, that, yeah, the, I mean, we have already uh, uh, hedge funds, where well, funds uh, which, ha which, which they do uh, a third party funding that is very uh, usual in, uh, in arbitration. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, that could be a solution, that, that's true, for, for Vulture Fund to. to to, to, to being uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the back room and to finance the litigation. Uh, um, and they could avoid the, 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 the legislation. That, 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 that's true. Just, uh, just uh, a few remarks on the, on the second and, and, and third point. Uh, just like Mathias, I do not see any basis for uh, what you have suggested. Uh, I think it will be completely... Um, uh, quashed by the European Court of Human Rights on the basis of right to property, which is personal, uh, attached to the person. So there is no possibility of joining a state property to, um, to uh, property of citizens located abroad. Um, um, regarding rating agencies, um, uh, a few things, because uh, there have been some attempts to um, 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 uh, large claims uh, against um, uh, rating agencies uh, for um, um, low quality uh, ratings. Not meaning, not meaning uh, bad ratings, but uh, not reflecting the uh, financial situation of, uh, of the issuer. Um, most of them and when we're talking about um, a public issuer, uh, you have to keep in mind that um, uh, it is an opinion uh, given by the rating agency on a public issuer. So I would say an information of general interest. So it will be impossible uh, to help the responsibility, to hold the responsibility of uh, the credit rating agencies on that ground. It won't pass the test of freedom of expression unreached in Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, and um, Matthias mentioned the um, uh, Europe, many European regulations adopted regarding uh, credit rating agencies. Uh, the only possibility uh, for uh, a credit rating agency to be held responsible 
It's not because um, uh, they were not, uh, their prediction was not true uh, eventually. It's only on the basis of a, a violation of a provision of the regulation. So for instance, you did not publish this report, you did not explain why you did, um, you, you gave this uh, AAA grade, and so on and so forth. So you, you have so many, I would say, purely procedural um, um, regulations that are included in the regulation of credit rating agencies, and um, the credit rating agency can only be held responsible for the violation of, of, of those regulations, not uh, for uh, bad predictions, uh, basically. It would be impossible. Would be, and mostly for, um, uh, I would say, a, a public issuer. It's quite different with a private issuer because uh, in, um, in US courts and in uh, European courts, in European Court of Human Rights, we have a distinction between um, uh, truly free speech and commercial speech. And for private issuers, it would be commercial speech. So uh, we have different standards, but for uh, public issuers, uh, I would say uh, it's impossible. Uh, um, I have one comment regarding this idea of vulture uh, funds avoiding the loi sapin by becoming uh, third party funders. I don't think it would work uh, because one of the things that vulture uh, hedge funds uh, um, really work for is in order to uh, surmount the difficulties, the procedural difficulties of having all these uh, small people who wouldn't go to court because there are no procedural uh, devices uh, for them to go there. So it's not only the issue of uh, buying the claims uh, and then funding would be, uh, be useful for this, but it's also the procedural issue of how do you manage with all these uh, small claims to go to court. So I don't really think that it would work. And then I have a comment uh, and a question. We have seen there is a chaotic situation with all these uh, different settings for litigation at the international level, arbitrate, uh, arbitration, also domestic courts. Did they work uh, completely in isolation or was there any kind of a relationship between uh, courts or judges in order to create some common, I, I guess there wasn't, but some common solution for, for all this uh, mess? Um, so regarding the, f the first point, which uh, uh, third-party funding, uh, in any case, it couldn't work with the French bill, the Loi saint pin because the Loi saint pin is giving a definition. Uh, it's not giving any definition of, of, of vulture fund. It's just saying if you buy, uh, in certain condition, a bond on the, on the secondary market and uh, for a low price, and then you trying to litigate on the ground of this bound, then there is a specific provision. So uh, this would mean that the claimant, even if he has a funder, will be in this position and will be in the scope of the rule. Uh, so that couldn't work. But it could maybe work uh, for um, uh, regarding the Belgium law where the, 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 the definition is different and it's more uh, on, the, on, the, on the type of claim, uh, it's no more based on the type of claimant uh, uh, trying to litigate. Um, that's, that's the first point. And the second question, I think I forgot what you said, sorry. <laughs> um, no, it was whether there were um, called, the there was, no, but I'm not sure I have the answer, but. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, whether there was a coordination uh, between courts uh, oh yeah. and parties uh, for the... Uh no, I, don't, I was thinking not coordination among parties, but rather whether the litigation itself worked as isolated litigation. So one proceeding was uh, going on here and another one was going on some, in some other country and there was absolutely no uh, relation between judges or arbitrators to take into account what was happening somewhere else. Well, in fact, regarding the, 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 the arbitration, uh, uh, nearly the, as, as, uh, none of them really succeed. Uh, some are pending, some have been abound, aban uh, abandoned, some uh, are um, uh, li led to, uh, to a dismissal of the claim. So there wasn't any uh, award uh, sentencing the state. Uh, so. I mean, the, tri the, the arbitration tribunal has not been put in the position to have to 
uh, to take into account domestic court decision. But maybe they would have done so if, if there was a case, but they, 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 they have, nev have never been in the position to, to have to take into account, uh, let's say, uh, a New York court decision uh, with a sentence against Argentina, for example, because they, there was not any award sentencing the state. Uh, so for, from what I know, there, there, there wasn't any uh, such a, a, a try of uh, coordinate uh, between, the, between the forum, the forum. Uh, but of course, we don't know what happened uh, in uh, behind the scenes, uh, because you have uh, small categories of actors. Uh, you know the same law lawyers, the same law firms. So perhaps there is somehow a kind of uh, unknown uh, uh, coordination or whatsoever. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, I think it's time to, to let our uh, lecturer relax a bit and uh, we can go on discussing, of course, but as usual, outside a glass and, uh, and a friendly glass uh, and, uh, is waiting for all of us, so please enjoy the, the, the moment. But before, thanks again to, to our lecturers, to this vibrant and <laughs> And lively lectures, and uh, it took me two years to attract you to Luxembourg. I hope I won't need two years to have you back. Thank you very much.